Hi everyone, welcome to the feedback video for uh, developmental psychology within uh, Introduction to Psychology on FutureLearn from Monash University. Um, I'm here with uh, Chiara, one of your mentors from this course. I'm Matt Mundy, Director of Education for Psychology, and we are going to have a quick chat around some of the, the discussions you guys, some of the questions you guys have been having uh, around the course this week. Um, so Chiara, what, what have been some of the key kind of discussion points that our learners have come up with? Okay, well we've got two points to discuss today and what I love mm. about these as well is that they're not really about the content that we put there. Okay. So they really in, the content that we've got has really inspired some discussions from learners that have gone off into other areas, mm. which I love. So the first one was, uh, I think there was one step where we just talked briefly about the debate between nature and nurture. And we do frame it like a debate a lot of the time, but one of the learners pointed out that we're not really debating over which one's mm -hmm. right anymore? We've kind of come to the conclusion, conclusion, sorry, that they that they interact a lot. So Oscar posted, I think, a link to something about epigenetics, which is a really um, kind of new area. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are interested in epigenetics, actually, uh, the Monash Biological Psych course does actually cover that one. So that's a, that's a good one to get into a little bit. But could you tell us a bit about how mm. epigenetics fits into this this debate? Oh, well, okay, so epigenetics is the idea that, so you have a genome, our DNA is, each of us has a unique DNA fingerprint, right? But epigenetics is the study of how various genes within that genome can be switched on or off. So we, we all have a set of DNA that doesn't change across our lives uh, unless it's altered by radio, uh, radiation or some, some sort of um, external force. Our DNA profile wouldn't change. But our epigenetic profile can change. Uh, that means genes can either be switched on or off. Their, their expression either uh, is positive or is absent. Um, and there are elements in our environment, for example, that can cause a gene to be switched on or switched off. Um, and so that's where uh, the interaction between nature and nurture could become really real and really clear, is you can see uh, an example where the environment can epigenetically change uh, the expression of your DNA. Um, uh, one example of that I can think of is that the current uh, concerns around the use of certain plastics in, um, in, in, in say, food containers. There's uh, evidence that the, the plastics, say, it within uh, clear, water bottle, clear water bottles, if they degrade over time, can produce a certain chemical that can epigenetically alter, uh, so change the expression of your, G your DNA and cause um, issues, for example, cancers, um, that then, uh, uh, obviously affect your well-being. But from a psychological point of view, um, have you got an example for us? Yeah, I guess thinking about this course as developmental, one of the things that we do think about um, as children developing is um, aggressive behaviours and antisocial behaviours. Um, and there is a gene that does uh, that's related to this. So it's called the, the monoamine oxidase A gene. So we know that that's related to aggressive and antisocial behaviours. But one really interesting way that it interacts with the environment is that people have found that a lot of people who have this gene don't really show any more antisocial behaviours than someone who doesn't have the gene. But if someone with that gene grows up in an abusive um, household, then they are far, far, far more likely right. to express those behaviours. And I think that's a really good way to explain as well um, how we talk about environmental influences and why these behaviours develop, but why some people who grow up in an abusive household don't go on to express those behaviours, whereas some do. So we can see that real interaction between between nature and nurture there. Great. And, and as, as Kiara said, if, if that is a, a debate and a, and a question that really uh, floats your boat, then go and, go and have a look at biological psychology uh, from Monash in the same group of courses that you're currently in, uh, I think you'll find that really interesting. Now the other point of discussion that I found really interesting was um, on the step talking about the case of affluenza, so our mm. legal case um, about the boy who was kind of given a lighter sentence for um, drunk driving and killing somebody because the judge uh, decided that his upbringing, he didn't really learn right and wrong enough, so taking that into account. Um, what are your thoughts on this one? I think um, I think as many of you will have found, and if, if you haven't looked at this, take a look. It's, it is really interesting. It's um, an incredibly divisive and difficult thing to, 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 I guess, really get to grips with. And 
Um, one of the things you'll learn about next week are, uh, or learn more about rather, are the, the, the stages of moral reasoning. And I think that relates to this in, in a number of ways in that, you know, you, you kind of have to interpret uh, people's behaviours from um, not only your own set of morals, but also the set of morals and understanding of the, 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 the culture and the, they're within that that person has as well. Um, and so, you know, as a judge making a determination uh, of, of a defendant, there are, I guess, two sets of moral principles that are trying to line up. There's the judge's understanding of the defendant's moral principles, and then there's the judge's own um, interpretation of the law, which might be driven by his or her moral, moral principles. And then we also have the question of um, it, how much do we take into account the 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 upbringing, the development, or the, the 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 stages that the defendant has been through? So the opportunities they've had to learn right from wrong, um, the 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 tools they've been given from society to do the right thing. Um, and obviously one sort of very firm answer would be, well, the law is the law. And the other side of it is, well, you only can really say that if you have a firm understanding of the principles of society. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very difficult, I mean, what do you think? Yeah, it's a, it's, it raises a lot of really interesting questions. And some people do point out that um, while it might be good for the judge to be taking in um, learning and res what they have learned and their experiences already, it seems to be that they don't do that very often mm. for underprivileged people who haven't had the chance to learn as much as well, um, and they're not given the same privilege of moral mm. stages in, in their judgments. So I think what you're hinting at there is, is, is yet another layer of consideration which, which might be, you, you could call it unconscious bias, or in fact, Possibly even conscious bias. Um, that the the you know your personal interpretation of someone else's set of morals and understandings based on your assumptions about who that person is uh, and their own background and and, and your your uh, maybe stereotypical response to um, the, the the situation that person might find themselves in. Um, and so I think yeah, there's there's once again, a number of different layers that you have to uh, get through in order to understand why someone um, can form an opinion um, that, that might uh, differ from your own. Mm. It really also raises the question as well as how much we should be taking, like accommodating for past experiences mm -hmm. and how much we should be then thinking about what these future experiences will be. I mean, you can see these sorts of principles play out in, in classrooms as well, that it's we wouldn't advise a teacher to treat every child the same because their backgrounds and experiences are obviously very different. But someone who's come from a very um, tumultuous family background and, and can't sit still and can't you know behave the same way that the other children do, we wouldn't treat them the same, right. but we also wouldn't allow that to continue just because they haven't learnt those skills right and we take it as a teaching opportunity that's right and then the the corrective action you take with that individual would be different mm. to the corrective action you take with another child that you have uh, maybe explained a great detail and you're aware of the the the, the interventions that have happened in the past mm. um so yeah I mean, it's like i said it's a multi-layered thing um but this particular case if you haven't had a look go and take a look it is very interesting uh, so next week, um, I think I mentioned, yes, you're going to learn more about uh, the moral stages uh, of reasoning. Um, mm -hmm. And what else will we um, And the other major thing, really, that we're going through is just the stages of the lifespan and talking oh, about yeah. what the kind of the turning points and what are the things that are quite important to those stages. So we'll, we'll go through the whole lifespan next next week. Great. Well, enjoy that and we'll see you in the next one. See you later.